ability to listen to God. If you're a guest here today, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we, my goal is always that you learn something. Always. I'm not ever going to get up here and just mumble jumble and pull things together. And I prepare and I'm ready to teach. And, and my goal is for you to learn something. And not only that, it's to learn something that can change your life. Literally. You will hear something today, whether you've been a Christian for a long time or not. It, this just may remind you. You will hear something today that you can leave here today and use it. You can leave here today and use it. And, uh, and that's my goal always for you. Uh, in your notes, in your bulletin, there are two pieces of paper in there. One of them is for our life groups that meet during the week, and they, they discuss the message, and there's questions in there for, for them to discuss. Uh, and the other thing is notes to fill in the blanks. And, and at the top of both of those is, I'm sorry, go back one more. At the top of one of those is what point in this message is most impactful for you? How does it challenge or affirm your thinking? And how will you put into practice <clears throat> what you learn today? So the, the, the uh, verses that I'm using for the basis of this series is Jesus in John 8, 31, 32 saying, you are truly my disciples if you what? Remain faithful to my teachings. If you're new at this whole Christian thing, if somebody was to come up and go, you know what, what makes you a Christian? Well, there's the answer. You are truly my disciple because a Christian is a disciple of Jesus. If you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, a lot of people use this verse. A lot of people use this verse as a, you hear John 3, 16 and you give your life to Christ and they give... But we live a life of freedom, and that's what we're talking about in this message series. All the things we do, the Holy Spirit that comes to us, it sets us free and enables us to minister to people in Jesus' name. Now, now, in a relationship, would you say that conversation is important? If you think conversation is important, raise your hand. And if you're a guy and you didn't, I, that's why your wife just hit you in the ribs just now for that happened. But in any relationship, and, and, and I know, uh, uh, Lisa, I'm going to talk about us for just a second because we've been around for a while and, and Nick's going, no, don't talk about. So, so here, here's how our conversations go because we, we, we convert, converse, we converse pretty well. Um, a, 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 few, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a study that said the average married couple spends 27 minutes, I know what you're going to think, every hour. 27 minutes in meaningful conversation a week. Ah, you're going to start counting, aren't you? You're going to start counting. 27 a week. Now, I, I, know I used to be a therapist, so I know that you can do less than 27 a week. You, you're not getting along real well, but you, but you can do it. It's easy to do that when you're just going through business. So, so Lisa and I, were average night, we're, we're sitting around, and we're sitting in the living room, and we're making eye contact, and we're, we're talking about things. And then, and then somewhere in there, before too long, I get distracted. I get distracted because of something on the TV, or I get distracted because she never gets distracted but I get distracted and, and, and then I get up and I go into the kitchen to get a snack and, and, and I'm within hearing distance so I can hear whatever she's saying by the way when I'm at a distance and I say huh don't ever say huh that's not a good thing she keeps talking and, and then I throw in an uh huh and, and all and then uh, there comes a break in the conversation then I sneak off into the bathroom or whatever business I want to take care of and, and, and I'm thinking she's finished talking to me, and I hear, <laughs> and huh never works. It's never a good thing to say huh, and then I yell, I'm not in there anymore. So, but we do that more than 27 minutes a week, a month, whatever the thing, whatever the thing said. We've been married for 44 years, so I think we're doing it okay. I could always improve on that somewhat. <laughs> I saw an article this week that said this in, in an address, in addressing the 27 minutes of meaningful conversation. Because I posted it on Facebook and everybody went, what's meaningful conversation? 
No girl said that. No female said what's meaningful conversation. Every male went, what's meaningful conversation? Is it cowboys? Is that a meaningful conversation? So one article says that things you should talk about every day. Now, men, if you want to make a good impression, get your pen and paper out right now and make this list. And I promise you, if you do this all the time, she's going to go, stop talking to me. You talk too much. But one art, this article says this, every single day you should sit and talk about your goals. That sounds like your boss at work, doesn't it? You should, you should talk about your hardships. You should talk about health. You should talk about happy times. You should ha talk about the future and what you are grateful for. Now, I sat there this morning looking at these lists going, so do we talk about them all at the same time or, or do we talk about it some in the morning? Which one's a morning one? When, you know, which, one's, which one's an evening one? But, but there are people apparently that do this. I just cannot believe that that possibly happens. But if you wrote that down, men, that's a good thing for you to go to and, and talk about. So how good, here's the question for you. How good are you at listening to God? Because to be honest with you, when I look at the way I get distracted from the woman that I love so much and I love talking to her and I love listening to her and, but, but when I look and see how distracted I get sometimes with Lisa I think whoa I get way more distracted when I'm talking to God right? And, you know, are, are you guys with me? You know, you know how hard it is to talk to a spirit? And, and the key to us listening to him is, is getting our heart and our mind and our spirit in the right place. And, and, and getting your spirit in the place in the first place means giving your life to Jesus Christ. Because when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you become his disciple and you remain faithful to his teachings, what you have with you all the time that you can tune into any time is the Spirit of God at work, on the phone, in the middle of a fight with your spouse. Anytime you tune in, all of a sudden you have a power that you don't have on your own as a human being. Because if you filter everything you're doing through the Spirit of God, and I'm going to talk about how to do that better as we go along, uh, it just makes life so much better. And a lot of us don't even go looking for the Spirit of God until we've been away from Him so long that we don't even feel Him near. And I think that is the biggest bonus by far before, besides our salvation that, that we have that ongoing connection that spiritual antenna that someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ doesn't do. But I hear from people all the time and they say, I really don't understand the Bible. And how can I hear God talking to me? Well, prayer is the most, I wouldn't say, it's the most basic important discipline in our faith as Christians. And in the conversations we have with God, I'll just tell you something, and I don't know what percentages it should be, but you should be listening way more than you're talking. Brilliant. Men, that's all we have to do is listen with the wives. It's that, it's that, much, that much easier. But, but, but listening, we've got to get to where we listen. Now, when we do talk, we need to say things like, Forgive me for my sins, and, and, uh, and Lord, I, I, I'm glad to be with you today, and, and welcome him, and, and reading from the Word of God, and, 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 and that's how we get to where, in any situation, you have him there with you to guide you, to guide you. Look at Luke 8, 8. Jesus said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Now, I'm going to read you a parable that Jesus taught the disciples um, on listening to the Spirit of God and learning how to do that, and then we're going to go from there. It's just a few verses, but it's Luke 8, verses 
it's, it's Luke 8, verses 4 through 15. 4 through 15. One day, Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed, Jesus said. As he scattered it across the field, some seed fell on the footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns and grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand, Jesus said. His disciples asked, what, did, what does this parable mean? He replied, you're not permitted, you were permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I use parables to teach the others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. Verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds of the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while and then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. I think what we have to be careful of with with our thoughts about the Holy Spirit is He's there to be counsel. Matter of fact, when Jesus was getting ready to give His life, He's telling the disciples, you know, I'm going to leave, and when I do, I'm going to send you a counselor. I'm going to send you somebody that's going to help you understand the Word. I'm going to send somebody that's going to help you have wisdom. It's, it's going to help you be everything that you need to be. Now, I will tell you, it's very hard when you're talking to a friend to explain the Holy Spirit if the friend doesn't know the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, I'd be willing to bet, well, I've seen it for years. There, there are people that sit in churches every Sunday and they've never had that fertile soil to grow the Spirit in them. So what happens is is they take a faith like Christianity, which is paid for by Jesus, his life, and they turn it into a book of rules just like every other religion that's out there. And that's what we have to be careful of. We, We can't focus so much on the rules without using our spiritual antenna to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us the things that we have to. So it's the condition of the heart and the condition of the mind. And and to start off with, the absolute best way to understand what God is saying is to hear God through the Holy Scriptures. Remember, I told you one of the questions that people ask me all the time is, "I I just don't understand the Bible. Well, I would tell you two things. If you have a King James Version Bible, you probably need to upgrade to a more modern one that you can understand a little bit better. Uh, I actually heard a person say one time, well, the King James was good enough for the apostles. That ought to be good enough for me. It wasn't written to the 1300s, so the apostles were way gone by then. So you're reading something written in the 1300s. So... Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, all scripture is what? God breathed. 
And your friends will go, well, just a bunch of men sat down and, and, and wrote the Bible. Look, the Bible is, has all these books that are written by all these different men and they come together and they all go together. That's impossible. There's no other book in the world that's that way. All scripture is God breathed. These men as they wrote them from the Old Testament to the New were hearing from the Spirit of God. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in what? Righteousness. Well, I can't be righteous. I'm, I'm a human being. I'm not Jesus. No, the Holy Spirit, Jesus makes you righteous. Now, are you living righteously? That's the question. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been made righteous. But are you living a righteous life? And that's where you go here. That's where you go here. Jesus said, remain faithful to my teaching. That's how we get to the righteous living. And then verse 17 said, so, so that the servant of God may thoroughly be equipped for every good work. Here's, here's something if you've never been there before. If you've never done anything more than just going to church and, and, and a lot of people, I'm not saying anyone in this room, but a lot of people go to work and no one knows their, their faith and, and, and they never share what God is doing in their life with people and, and, and they, they, they struggle with that. Here's the most amazing thing. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you start doing the things that God wants you to do, and people come to me all the time and they've had a near-death experience and they go, I think God's got something major planned for me. I, I just can't wait. And three weeks later, they're off the rails and everything. And, 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 and the bottom line is, is God's not going to give you great big things until you do the little things. There's a whole lot of things in here about how to treat your family and how to treat neighbors and how to love people and, 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 and the things that, that cause you to be disconnected from God. All those things are in there and you have to start living them. And then what happens is if you've made that commitment to do that, you'll start growing in your faith and then God will present you with opportunities that will just blow you away. It will blow you away. That's not a, that's not a sales pitch. It's truth. It's truth. I've seen it over and over and over again in, in my life, in my family's life, and uh, in other people that I'm around all the time and in LCC, it, it happens. The more you know the Word of God, the better you know God's general will for your life. Let me say that again. You might want to write that down. The more you know the Word of God, the better you know God's general will for your life. So, you come to me and you go, Royal, I'm just praying, you know, God, God, what, do you, what does God want me to do? And, I, and I'll ask you something like, well, do you study the word of God? Are you studying the word of God? Are you already doing the things that he's already told you to do? Because once you start doing that, he'll give you the bigger things to do. When you know God's general will then, then you're better able to discern, to discern God's uh, specific will. You know, which job do I get? What, you know, who do I marry? Uh, this, this person that I'm dating, is, is this the right person for me to be with? And, and, and if any of those things pull you away from your righteousness, I can't tell you how many women sat in my counseling office and said, I just thought if I was around him enough, he would come to know Jesus. And, and I I say this all the time, it's, it's way easier to pull somebody down than it is to pull somebody up. And it's much more easier to pull somebody down when they're desperate. By the way, don't ever be desperate when you're looking for a mate. Because the desperation will override the rest of it. And, and then it's very easy to think, oh, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just, I can't tell you over the years how many women I've, sat, I've seen with their kids in church and the husband has never, ever, ever gone to church. And you know who has the, lar who has the biggest, uh, uh, who has the biggest, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Influence. Good, from this section. That's good. Yeah. The one that has the, yeah. <laughs> is the dad. That's my daughter, in case you're wondering right there. 
Have I done okay with that part of it? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Studies show they, they actually did a longitudinal study because there's a very high percentage of, a, of young adults that drop out of church when they, out, when they graduate high school. A lot of them in the middle of high school. And, and what they discovered was that when the mom herself was a spiritual influence and took the kids to church, a higher percentage of that group dropped out of school than any other group. And then, what do you think's the best? When the man and the woman are both churchgoers, then, the, then that's the second highest group. It's, it's a good percentage, not nothing like the other. But the group that stayed in the most or left for a while and then went back to church were the ones that were raised by a spiritual dad who had that influence on them. Dad, you have no idea the impact spiritually that you have on your kids. They're watching you. Just like they watch what you do for a living and everything else you do, they're watching that spiritual influence. And, and you have a powerful impact on them. So let's look at listening. Um, let's look at listening is a condition of the heart and the mind. Whether you're listening to God or listening to people. Number one, some people are not ready or open to hear. You've got to want to hear. You've got to, a lot of people, a lot of people, especially adults, turn their life over to Christ or make a decision that they're going to follow Christ when they're under a terrible situation. They've lost their job. They've lost their money. They've lost their wife. They've lost anything else that seems to be important to them. And then they go, okay, I'm going to go to God. And, and, they, and they go, and they come to church, and they get involved, and they serve, and they get baptized, and they're reading their Bible until they get a girlfriend, or until they get a job, or until. And that's what, the, that's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, a farmer went out to plant a seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds ate it. On every farm, you've got the, the rows where, where um, the crop grows, and then you've got a path between. And that path between is constantly being stepped on and beat down, and it just doesn't, the seed hits there and it just blows away or it dries up. And, and that's what he's saying here about the person who, who, who isn't, who hears it, but then they don't respond to it. One is the soil is compacted, and the other is that the path is too narrow. The second part is when he explains it in verse 12 says, the seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts. And it's so easy. It's so easy. And I'll just tell you, y'all don't see those things. And over the years, those are the things that break the heart of a pastor more than anything. When people come and they're all excited about God because all these bad things have happened in their life and, and they commit their life and they get baptized and, 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 and then one day you hear something good has happened and then another day you hear something good has happened and next thing you know, they're gone. They're gone. The only reason God was important to them was they wanted rescued. And that's what, that's what Jesus is, is talking about here. They get stepped on, the birds eat it, it goes away. The things that make that happen are pride, fear, and sin. Pride that you don't need God, fear of missing out on the things of the world, and then just flat disobeying God. It hardens the heart. And... Uh, Scripture talks about spiritually, you can have your heart hardened, hardened. Have you ever had a time where you just, you're reading your Bible, it means nothing. You go to church, it means nothing. You're just struggling, you're just struggling, and, and you can't feel God. Scripture calls that a hardening of the heart. And the only way to fix that is to go back and, and focus on your relationship with God. John 2.20 says, all who do evil hate the light Refuse to go near it for fear of their sins will be exposed. 
But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they are doing, what, that they are doing what God wants. You have such an impact on other people when you do the things that God wants you to do. So the second groups, some of them aren't ready to hear it. They're not ready to obey. The second group, some remain spiritually immature. Maturity does not come automatically with time. You've met people like that. They've been a Christian their whole life. At least they've been to church their whole life. And they just don't seem to have that, that spiritual maturity. Now, I will tell you this. I've seen the right message, the right time, the right openness to the Spirit take someone who's been just a religious go-to-church person their whole life and change them into a true follower of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't happen automatically. Just because somebody's been in church their whole life, it doesn't happen automatically. Luke 8, 6 says, Other seed fell amongst the rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while and then they fall away when they face temptation, when something else seems better than their relationship with God. You don't have to go do, you know what? I've told you all this before. I don't know how many gym memberships that I've bought over the years. And you don't have to raise your hand up, but I know almost all of you in here are in the same boat that I am. And, and, and the work is so hard that you just, you, you get in there and you get after it. And then the next thing you know, you're just going, man, I just, I don't want to get up early. I don't want to do that. I'm, I want to eat a milkshake. Just all of those kind of things mess with you. And that's what happens with us spiritually. We, we get into it and we start working at it. And, and we do like, I'm going to read my Bible for an hour a day. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, and before you know it, you kind of start backing off. It messes with your spirit. It messes with your reading the Bible. You need Christian friends. How many Christian friends do you have? One of the main reasons we have life groups in our church is, is you know, there's a lot of nice people here, right? I mean, you know what I hear from guests all the time? Your people are so nice. They said hi to me there. They said hi to me in the bathroom. They, they said hi to me when I was walking down the hall. When we came in, I got hide, hide, hide all the way here. And, and, and that, was just, that was just awesome. But those aren't our real friends, right? The reason we have life groups is it's a way for us to come together and be friends and learn from each other. Learn from each other something besides partying or whatever else we do out there with our friends. It's important that we have our Christian friends and it's important that we have our church. Uh, I keep reading a new article almost every day about, about the, the, the people that have fallen away from church during the pandemic. The number one reason they give is, I just lost a habit. I just got out of the habit. Now, how sad is it that it was just a habit, Right? You know, how sad that it's just a habit. It's easy to lose a habit. Number three, they focus on God instead of themselves. Focus on God instead of self. Other seed fell among the thorns and grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Um, when my kids were little and played sports, we, Nick played baseball over here in, in, in Euless and, and, and Brooke played soccer, and all the sports leagues had a rule. You couldn't practice on Wednesday night or play games on Wednesday night or Sunday morning. That was just, that was a rule. If you were coaching, you did it, you got, you got penalized for that. Nowadays, there are so many things that people do on Sundays. And, and, and we have to decide. We have to decide. It's funny because one year Nick was on this team and... Uh, there was a big tournament that we were in, and Nick was a catcher on the baseball team. And uh, 
we played on Saturday, and then the coach came to us and said, okay, y'all, our game is tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. And uh, I, I went to the coach and said, hey, um, Nick's not playing and missing church on Sunday. And the coach was like, oh, he was shocked. He was just shocked that, that, I, that I would say that because Nick loves to play, and he's a good ball player, and he's one of their ball players. Well, guess what happened? Later on, they called and said, hey, we got the game moved till later on in the afternoon. See, we, we, we want so bad for our kids to experience certain things. And the best thing for your kid to experience is growing up in a Christian church. And, and having friends there that believe the same things that they believe. And, and it's so important for that. And I know it's hard because we think all these other things in the world are, are so much more important. And, 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 and that's, what, that's what happens um, when we don't make God the most important thing. And so they never grew into maturity. We've got to focus on when we focus on ourselves, these are the things that we struggle with or look forward to. We Anxiety, depression. We look for pleasure to make us feel better. We, uh, get, we get our feel-goods from people, and then we get our feel-goods for religion, but we don't necessarily have the relationship. We have to remove the distractions for that to happen. And then number four, trust and commit to obey God before you know what he asks. Oh, you want to know one of the things that changed me more than anything was when I said, okay, God, I'm going to do what you want. Uh, I've told you all this before. People will come to me and they'll go, I, I, you know, I really want to give my life to Christ, but I don't want to have to go to Africa. And I'll go, you don't want to have to go to Africa. No, I, I don't want to give my life to Christ. And he sends me to Africa. I don't want to be out in the middle of a tribe somewhere and, and, and have to give my life and all that. I'm going, dude, I want to promise you something. Let me promise you something. If God is sending you somewhere, you will be so ready to go. There's no way in the, if you knew me in my 20s, there's no way in the world that goofy guy would end up being a pastor. There's no way in the world that he would plant a church. There's no way in the world he would have got an awesome wife like Lisa. You know? But that was God. That was that commitment that I made. That, and, and God blessed that. And, and, and it, just, it just goes from there. And again, though, it's going to start off with little things. For me, biggest life change for me was after giving my life to Christ at 26 years old, they asked me to teach 11th grade boys Sunday school. These kids knew more about the Bible than I did. And it scared me to death. And, I, and I, told the, I told the guy, I said, you know, I don't, I'm pretty new. And I'm, I just committed my life. There's, there's just no way. There's just no way. And uh, that afternoon, I get called from a friend of mine's dad who was the head guy at the Irving Boys Football Association. And I always loved coaching football. I said, hey, Royal, this is David. I said, hey, David, how's it going? He goes, hey, look, I, 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 got, a great, I, I got a great idea. He said, um, how would you like to coach again? I said, well, and I've been thinking about that. I'd actually talked to, been talking to Lisa. I said, that would be great. He said, he said, well, here's the deal. We've got a team. They were in the championship game last year, and they've, we've lost the coach, and most of the kids are coming back. Oh, really? And this is kind of exciting. If you know anything about coaching, you know, this is a, it's just laid out. The only thing I can do is either go in and screw it up or make them win. One thing or the other. Those are, those are the two choices I had. But as he was telling me that, because I used to coach the Cowboys in the IBFA, I said, well, what's the name of the team? He said, it's the Saints. And I just went, oh my gosh, God's given me the choice. I can go coach the saints or I can teach the saints. And I said, oh, David, I've already got something that I'm going to be doing. And I called that guy back and told him I would teach 11th grade boys. And that's, that was the start. 
That was the thing that started. That's, that's the thing that gets me going. We've got to be thinking about doing kingdom-minded things, the things that God wants you to do. You've got to decide up front, okay, God, I'm going to start studying the Word. I'm going to focus on worship. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to live as righteous life as I can, and then I'm going to be ready for whatever you call me to do. As a matter of fact, you won't only be ready, but you'll be excited. We've got to The seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to, and patiently produce a harvest. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only going to be fooling yourself. It's interesting because I had a friend of mine who, um, who was a guitar player. And he's the best guitar player I ever heard. I mean, the dude could be sitting next to the radio and he could hear a song for the first time and play it. I mean, at a professional level, play it. And he was a, and he was a teenager and, uh, and I knew him and he, he came to our church for a little while. And, uh, but you know how he got that good? He locked himself up in his room all day long and played the guitar. There's no way he wouldn't have got good. I mean, that, that, that's just what he did. Now, the problem with that is because he focused on his guitar all the time, he had no social skills. It was so awkward being around that guy. It's like he couldn't, he couldn't even talk without a guitar in his hand. You know, I mean, that, that's, just, that's just the way it was. And, and um, That's the kind of focus that we need to have on God. Now, I'm not saying you lock yourself up in your room and you read your Bible all day. You focus on being righteous. Because guess what? You can be righteous anywhere at any time. You may not be welcome anywhere at any time if you're righteous. And I'm not talking mean righteous. I'm just talking about being the the good person. The person who follows God. The person that sets themselves up to do the things that God wants them to do. What, what if you did that? What if that was your focus? Because that's how your life changes. And when you talk to people who do great things for God, they've done that because they've made that commitment up front. God, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. What if you had that kind of passion in your life? I want to tell you something. It's exciting. It is exciting. And it's so much easier dealing even with the problems that we have in life. If you practice being connected with God, if you'll make that your number one thing, it's not going to take you away from your job and everything else you do, but you practice. You do your job practicing righteousness. You parent practicing righteousness. You next door neighbor practicing righteousness. practicing being a righteous. And, and then, you know what? Instead of yelling at the neighbor for not mowing their yard, you'll go mow their yard for them. That's what righteous people would do, right? Instead of cussing them out and going on because of that, you'll hear God. You'll hear him lead you. You'll hear him encourage you. You'll hear him counsel you, comfort you, warn you. He'll give you insight on how to handle things. He'll give you joy. He'll give you peace. He'll make you feel loved and confident and patient and know that you have a purpose. You know the number one, besides people feeling loved by Jesus, the number one thing they describe themselves with is, I have a purpose. For the first time in my life, I have a purpose. And that's to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, God's number one thing is for us to take with us as many people as we can when he comes back. And that's all of our job. And you guys have such more of an opportunity than I do. Everybody expects me to be righteous. But what if you, what if you in your office, everybody knew the first time I recommitted my life to the Lord, I, I walked in, I told some friends that I'd, well, first thing I did was I, I didn't go to a party that they invited me to at the office. And they came and asked me why. And I said, well, I, I just gave my life to the Lord and I, I don't 
feel like that's something that I'm supposed to do. So, okay, well, you know, so no more happy hour, all, you know, doing all the stuff that we did. And, and, uh, and for weeks, they made fun of me. You get tested. You get tested. For weeks, they made fun of me. And then it got less and less. And then they started coming and sitting at my desk to ask me questions. They came and talked to me about their marriage. They, and that's what made me start feeling that I was being called to be a counselor. Because I was living the righteous life and I just told them, these are things I'm not going to do anymore. I'll still be the best friend you could possibly have. I'm just not going to do that. And that's what, that's what we need to do. That's what, if we'll focus on God and focus on being living a righteous life. And by the way, that's not a judgmental life. The only time people should be uncomfortable with you and your faith is that they feel like they're not as good as you because they see you doing such good things, not because you tell them that they're sorry son of guns because they don't know Jesus. And people do do that sometimes, I promise you. Anyway, I'm going to close with that. Are you living the righteous Jesus follower life? That's the question today that we should take home with us today. And, and after the service, I'll be back there in the back if you want to come talk. Uh, maybe you've never been baptized. And, and all of a sudden you're sitting there thinking, you know, the, the number one thing to do to show my faith is to get baptized. Uh, come talk to me about that. Or you can put it on your Connect card. Or, or maybe you're, you're wanting to get more involved at Life Connection Church. Or maybe for the first time ever, you really want to commit your life to Jesus Christ. And all you have to do to do that, well, all you have to do, that sounds minor, doesn't it? You just have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for you and me so that we can be forgiven for our sins and be righteous and then live that righteous life. It's nothing special you've got to do. He's already done it. You don't earn your way. You don't get points. You don't have to have enough hearts to get, you know, to get to the next level. You just live out your life of righteousness. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you for today. And I, I pray, Lord, if there's anyone in here today who doesn't know you, who, or they know you, but they haven't made that personal commitment to you, that today be that day. And Lord, I just thank you for Jesus. I just thank you that we don't have to pass a test to follow you. We just have to give our lives to you. Make you the leader of our lives. And I pray for anyone in here today, Lord, that wants to do that, that today be the day. Lord, I, I lift us up as a church, and I pray that as we leave here today, we, we, we're committed to living the righteous life. Not perfect, but the best way we know how, being the person that you want us to be. I pray that for all of us, and I pray this in Jesus' name.